Welcome to One Plus One, I'm Kurt Fernley. My guest today is Australia's most decorated female Paralympian. Ellie Cole cemented her place in history by winning her 17th Paralympic medal in Tokyo. What a youngster, the 29-year-old veteran, Ellie Cole. Representing Australia, Ellie Cole. Ellie Cole, welcome to One Plus One. I'm very excited. 17 Paralympic medals, you're now the most successful uh, Australian Paralympic female competitor. How? Uh, it's a bit much. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I personally think anything over 13 showing off, but... Oh, do you? <laughs> Is that how many you have, 13? Yeah. Well, 13 is still an incredible achievement. I'm not entirely sure how I got to 17, because winning my 17th Paralympic medal, I kind of felt like exactly the same girl that I was when I went to my first Games in Beijing. Um, except just a whole bunch of time had passed. For my very first Paralympic medal, I was able to stand up next to Annie Williams, who you know really well, and win a medal in the 100 metre butterfly. And I just got the bug after that. I just got the bug. And it wasn't necessarily about winning. It was more about like just executing a race really well and being rewarded for it. I really enjoyed that experience. Um, and it was fascinating. like. I came home from my first games in Beijing with a silver medal. I just had this expectation on myself that I had to turn that into a gold medal at the London Games, which I did. But I don't know, it's like every single time you tick something off the box to do, you always look for something bigger and better as an athlete. And I enjoyed Tokyo so much, I was just having the best time and happened to win my 17th medal there, which did make me a, a nanny goat, as my, my <laughs> swim team like to call me. Um, but I think more than anything, it just goes to show how much I love Paralympic swimming and like the, the team environment and being away at a Paralympic Games. And I just happened to win a few medals while I was experiencing all of that. I, I grew up with Paralympic sport and it was like my sport was segregated kind of because wheelchair racing, there wasn't really an equivalent, but you grew up in para swimming, which there's always a direct comparison to the Olympic swimming next to it. Like, how did that make you feel when you're constantly got the comparison of Olympians next door? It's difficult. Um, I always grew up racing against able-bodied kids and I always grew up, you know, warming up in the same lane as like Susie O'Neill, which is incredible to think because she's been retired for such a long time. <laughs> But um, it was fascinating, like my role models growing up in swimming were always Olympians and they necessarily weren't Paralympians because I didn't really understand the world of Paralympic sport back then. But once I, once I knew that there was like a world out there for people with disabilities, I was like, get me involved, you know? <laughs> these are my people, like these people understand what it's like to be an athlete with a disability. No one in a Paralympic team has had an easy life. And we combine that with sport and training for an elite sport is, is difficult as well. And um, I think there's a lot of wonderful messages in there. But I really, I really noticed the difference between para and Olympic swimming when I started training with Kate and Bronte Campbell. Um, I was one of the, f actually, I think I am the first Paralympic athlete to train in an Olympic program, an, an Olympic program that's funded by Swimming Australia. And um, it was fascinating, like I was doing exactly the same sessions as them, like exactly the same time cycles, exactly the same sessions. And I, I would still go to our national championships, yet I would be still treated very differently. A lot of the kids around pool deck and stuff, they knew who I was, mainly because I trained with Kate and Bronte, but because like I'd won 15 medals prior to Tokyo. And it's like, what does it take for, you know, a Paralympic athlete to be considered an equal? Like, is it 15 medals? Is that really what it takes? Um, so I still think like there are so, there's such a long way to go, but seeing our community embrace our Paralympic team in Tokyo and like fight for our equal rights really um, made me very hopeful for the next four or eight years for our Paralympic athletes. Um, because I know that the community of, like communities around Australia really have that Paralympic bug. They want to see our Paralympic athletes perform really well and they want to be, 
they want to see us being treated as equals and um, it's really wonderful to be able to see that because it was it was very different when I was growing up. Before we get there, let's go back to growing up. How did you get yeah. involved in swimming? Um, I got involved in swimming through... Uh, I started a rehabilitation program when I was three from having my leg amputated from cancer. And uh, I went around in circles for so long. <laughs> like, <laughs> so long. Um, but I was so lucky. I have a twin sister and she would swim in a straight line. And, like, I would always try to mimic and imitate everything that she did. And so I think I, I recovered a lot more quickly because I had that strong family around me who was, like, helping me out a bit. Um, but I just love the water. I grew up on the Mornington Peninsula. We were at the beach every weekend and I just love to swim. And I, st I still do it 30, 17 metres later, which is <laughs> a bit different than beach swimming. When a, a disability enters the family, it can, it's, it's complicated. It bring, it, it's not just the individual that, that deals with, with the impact of it, it's the entire family. How, how did your family cope with having disability enter into the household? Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. Once you look at someone with a disability, you don't necessarily think about like the family that's behind them. Um, for me, I think I've actually coped with having disability better than anybody else <laughs> in my family. <laughs> I think that probably goes to show with my swimming career. I've really enjoyed having a disability. Like it's one of the best things that's happened to me. But um, having a disability in my family, I was never treated differently by my own family members and they never, they never really struggled with the idea of me having a disability. They struggled, and I think ha carry a lot of trauma from when I was sick with cancer. I think that's, that's the, the cause of, of where a lot of the trauma in my family comes from. I know that when I um, was sick, I was sick for about a year, and um, I know that my mum and dad, their relationship really suffered during that time. And I know that my brothers and sisters, um, they always, grew up and all of the focus and attention was always on me and getting me better. And I feel like they missed out on some really good quality time when I was sick with like just having normal family quality time. And like I see the effects of that 25, 30 years later. Um, so that for me is a really difficult pill to swallow. It's like, I don't know, I feel a little guilty in a way that I was sick, which I know it sounds ludicrous um, because having cancer is nobody's fault, but I don't know, you see, you see the negative impacts that it has had and it's a really difficult pill for me to swallow and talk about. But in a way, like if, if I hadn't gone through that, then my Paralympic journey never would have happened. So that's definitely been the silver lining. And I don't know if I ever use my swimming to like justify um, what I put them through, but uh, I know that they're really, really proud of me. And I guess I just have to accept that not everybody goes through an easy life. I can't protect them from everything. What about treatment from outside? How does the world see you as a kid? Um, <laughs> that's hard for me to answer. I have no idea how the world saw me as a kid because I was really oblivious and <laughs> I still am. <laughs> I was walking with um, a short statured friend of mine a few years ago and I, I said to her, I was like, why is everybody looking and turning their heads at us? And she's like, Ellie, we're walking through the shopping centre, you have one leg and I'm like a muscly dwarf. Like, what do you expect? <laughs> I was like, oh yeah, <laughs> I totally forgot about that. Um, so I was really oblivious to like, if I was treated any differently, I just wanted to do the same as my twin sister and be the same person as her basically. Um, and it wasn't until I started getting a little bit older that I realized that I was being treated a bit differently. Um, it was almost like any discussion that I had with someone that I didn't know, it was like almost, I always left feeling like I, it was really condescending and people weren't necessarily sure how to approach the conversation around disability. And I always talk about like when I was a bit younger and kids said to their parents like, mummy, what's wrong with that girl over there? They would get like a hit over the head and say like, don't, sh don't speak about it. Like it can't be spoken about. If you don't say, she won't know. I know. But then it's like they're embarrassed to speak about my disability and they're embarrassed to have a conversation with their own child about disability. And then, you know, fast forward to the Tokyo games like, like parents are approaching me on the street now and saying like, oh, do you mind if I tell, like teach my son or teach my daughter about your prosthetic and how it works? And are you a Paralympian? And then they want me to speak to them about being a Paralympian. And like that whole our door has opened in our community around speaking about disabilities and being more open about speaking. 
And I, that's wonderful. I know that the Paralympic movement has played a really big part in that. And so like, I'm really proud about that and being part of that. How were you introduced to the Paralympics first? I watched the 2004 Paralympics. Um, my, my PE teacher mentioned to me that there was a whole world out there for, for athletes with disability um, because I was always competing at school. <laughs> I don't know if, if you, when you competed at, at school sports, like race against able-bodied kids. Yeah, I was terrible. Yeah, <laughs> so was I. <laughs> Crawling after kids on the track <laughs> doesn't actually get you the win. Yeah, well, you did it in Kokoda and that was kind of impressive. I was pretty slow. I just said that was kind of impressive. That was very <laughs> impressive. Um, well, I, I competed against kids when I went to primary school as well, and I would always make it to like districts. Um, so I think I did a bit better than you. <laughs> yeah, a lot better than me. But I would never make it like past districts and I'd get really frustrated because I always thought it was not unfair in a way, but I was like, I'm a better swimmer than these guys. It's just that I'm missing a leg. And um, my PE teacher sat me down and was like, hey, I found like this, this pathway you can go down in school sport where you can race against kids with disabilities. And I did, and I crushed it. <laughs> I absolutely crushed it because I'd been racing against able-bodied kids my whole life. And it's like my bar was set really high, um, which is wonderful. How was the first Paralympics? Beijing, uh, you were 17? <laughs> I was 16. 16. What did it mean to you then to be a Paralympian? Um, for me at 16, I didn't understand the concept of the Paralympics at that time. Um, I knew it was a huge swimming competition and I knew that I wanted to be a Paralympian, but I didn't really understand the impact that it could have on a global scale at that time. I just wanted to have fun with my friends. <laughs> <laughs> It's like I was there as like an intern and just learning the ropes yeah. in a way. I don't know if you felt I, like that at, at your first Sydney. Paralympics. A hundred percent. I felt like it wasn't my team. I just got to watch the guys. I know. And I feel like I had to have like a little L plate on my shirt yeah. or something. Like I'm a learner here. <laughs> yeah. Your next games in London was very different to Beijing. You, yeah. you, were, you, you were on a mission. Uh, six medals. How was that? Um, the London Games for me was a bit, a, I don't know, I, I'm still not entirely sure how I feel about the London Games so many years later. I haven't really debriefed with myself <laughs> yet. Um, it was a bit of like a bittersweet Games for me. Like I, I loved being at the Games, but the, the lead up to the Games, I was, I'm very disappointed in how I manage myself as an athlete. Like I, I threw everything into my swimming career, which was good in a way, but it's like, I, have, I, I look back now and ask myself, like, at what cost? Were those four gold medals worth it? And, like, it was wonderful to win four gold medals. But I put myself through so much stuff that didn't sit well with me. Like, it's like, I felt like a bit of a doormat in a way as an athlete, which is it's sad to think back to that, that time. But I learned a lot from that experience and I haven't been a doormat since then. <laughs> you speak about how to go into a Games to win that gold medal, you have to sacrifice so much. What's too much? Um, oh, that's a good question. I think it's different, differs from person to person. Um, you know, for me, I felt like I wasn't, I was only 19 or 20 years old when I first moved to the AIS. Like I was fresh out of high school. I hadn't had too many personal life experiences because I'd spent my entire life training up until that point. And I, it wasn't that I was sacrificing a lot, like I knew what I'd signed up for, but I felt like into London, I hadn't really learnt that skill of saying no to people. I was saying yes to everything. I was doing everything that I was told. And there were times where I was feeling extremely uncomfortable. I felt like I was living a life that I didn't have any control over and nobody wants to live like that. And so, I don't know, I, I feel like in a way, I was giving everybody else the power and none of it to me. In a way, like, like I said, I am really happy that I won four gold medals in London, but I feel like I, I'm not really the person that won those gold medals. Like I did all of the work, but I don't know, it kind of just felt like I disassociated my, my mind from my body and it's like my body was just doing what it was told, but my mind was like going everywhere else. It's really hard to explain, um, but I, like I said, I learned so much from that experience and heading into the Rio Games, I took complete control of my program. Um, now that I'm nearly 30, <laughs> I, can, I can say no now. Um, and like, I have such a wonderful partnership with my coach now. It's not like a hierarchy, like we genuinely are a team and we work really well together. And it just makes the whole experience so much more enjoyable.
How important is the support of the people around you? It's critically important only because I, I think it's, it's nice to be able to celebrate with the people around you. But there are so many times as an athlete or a person with a disability where you really do struggle and it's very easy to feel alone and push people away. But I mentioned in Tokyo that I, it was my most enjoyable games because I had the support of my whole team around me and I really opened myself up to the team. And it's the same in my personal life. Every time I've, I've really opened myself up and accepted support from people um, and realised how many people are actually there to support you. It's wonderful. Um, it, it's certainly, for me, like a sense of community is really important. A sense of family is so important. Um, so to be able to have those guys there whenever I need them and to be able to celebrate with them as well whenever I need to. <laughs> is really nice. We still haven't celebrated Tokyo, but um, I get to see my family next month, so I'm really excited to go down, spend some time with them. Tell me about your partner, Sylvia. Sylvia and I, we met at the London Games. Um, uh, she was an events planner for the Paralympic Committee and uh, met her, I think, one of the post-game celebrations. And we had the greatest time. Um, and I think we really got to know each other quite well after the London Games. We were both really struggling with, you know, post-game blues, as a lot of athletes and staff members do. And when we're struggling through those times, we really lean on each other as a team to get through that. And um, I don't know, it's just, it was really nice to be able to spend time with somebody who wasn't an athlete but understood the athlete experience as well. And, um, yeah, we, we became friends and then, um, I don't know, we just had so many common interests and... Like I said, she just understood what it was like to be an athlete, but I didn't have to like compare my athletic achievements <laughs> with hers. <laughs> but uh, we've had a really wonderful life. We have two little dogs now, and uh, I think she's looking forward to me also though retiring from swimming and spending a bit more time at home. I think Tokyo was very difficult uh, being away for 13 weeks um, and with Sydney being in lockdown as well. So. It was nice to be able to come home from Tokyo and just spend some time with the family and the two dogs for now. <laughs> <laughs> for now? Grow our family. Really? Maybe. Who knows? I'm open to anything. <laughs> Maybe we'll get a third dog. <laughs> <laughs> Sit. Sit. Thank you. In Tokyo, I saw a leader of the Paralympic team. You know, it was obvious the way that you would hold yourself, the way that you would speak to the team, the way that you would speak externally. You really seemed to embrace that role. But mm -hmm. the flag, oh the, my the gosh, closing the ceremony, flag. that seems to amplify that leadership role. How was that experience, taking the flag into the closing ceremony? Well, you know how that experience feels. <laughs> it's pretty good. I think um, one of the most special experiences about being the flag bearer, though, it wasn't necessarily like in the athletes' village. Um, at the Tokyo Games, everybody would congregate downstairs and see the flag bearer off. It happened for both the opening and the closing ceremony. So everybody would get dressed up and see the flag bearer off and we would give a speech as the flag bearer to our team and we were able to address our team. And then um, we had our team lining up in two lines and I went down one side and gave everybody a high five. <laughs> and I came back the other side and gave everybody a high five. I, I just wanted to have like that moment of connection with every person from the team who had like given me the best experience. And then I remember I got to the end of the, the second line and I turned around and I saw like my whole Paralympic team lining up. And one of them started an Aussie, 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 oi, oi, oi. And like just looking back at them and holding a flag, it was like amazing. And then when I got to the stadium, um, our dietitian Vaughny had packed Kate McLaughlin and I some um, wine and cheese. And so we sat down and had a special little moment together and everyone from all the other countries was like, what? They bought their own wine and cheese. <laughs> We're having a great little time. And then, um, yeah, it was just amazing, the whole thing. We've come from a period of time in the sport where the Paralympians would s swim or compete in the ad breaks after the Olympians had taken to the stage. I know that you've experienced that. I've experienced that. Is that done now? Yes, I'd say so. In swimming, I know that that's done. I've seen our program go from Paralympic events being at the start and the end so that they can do the broadcast when the able-bodied events are on. Now, fast forward to 2020, the Paralympic events being interwoven and now being shown on the television just the same as um, 
the Able-Bot events. For me, it's wonderful, you know, before a, a broadcast event for swimming is on, the commentators are calling because they want to get facts right, they want to get information right, but they've never called Paralympic sport before, so they're not entirely sure how the classification system works. And, you know, I was trying to, <laughs> I was trying to explain to Ian Thorpe a couple of weeks ago about the point system in, in um, Paralympic swimming. And he, he mentioned to me that, that a swimmer had gotten over a thousand points, but that it wasn't a world record. And he's like, explain that to me. And I was like, well, I don't know how that works. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, it's fascinating that, um, yeah, you, you're seeing people like Ian Thorpe who are, who are trying to really understand Paralympic sports, the ins and outs of Paralympic sports. And um, I think, you know, when you've got allies like that behind you and that are genuinely curious, I think it's going to be nothing but good. I also, you know, seeing you on the front cover of Maxim. Yeah, I know. What, is, what does that mean for representation? Uh, it means a lot. I, I think I'm the first flat-chested girl to be on the front <laughs> cover of Maxim. <laughs> It was funny, mum, my mum was um, cooking a pavlova last week and she said to me, she's like, I can never make my, my pavlovas rise, they're always flat. And I was like, don't worry mum, it's still good. I'm like, I'm flat too and I ended up on the cover of Max. <laughs> <laughs> she appreciated that. But what does something like that mean to the Paralympic movement? It, uh, oh, you have to ask the Paralympic community. <laughs> For me, I know... If I saw another, like every time I see a Paralympian on a front cover, I just think it's so cool um, because I never saw that when I was younger. You know, seeing Paralympians or people with disabilities represented on magazine covers is important because you might not think that it makes a, a difference in that moment, but the flow on effect that that does actually have. Um, you know, Maxim's obviously a men's magazine. You necessarily wouldn't picture somebody with a disability on the front cover of a men's magazine. Um, so but to be able to do that myself, I believe would be reducing the stigma around that environment. Um, and anything that reduces the stigma, promotes people with disabilities, gets people, with, gets people talking about people with disabilities for me is a big plus. And I think that's why I accepted the wonderful opportunity of being a Maxim cover girl. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know that you've, you've called your time in the Paralympic movement, but there's still the Commonwealth Games in a year's time. What do you want out of those games? Well, I, I, I saw it in the Gold Coast how much our Australian community embraced Paralympic sport. A lot of people thought that um, the Commonwealth Games was the first time that para events had been integrated into the Commonwealth Games. I think it's just that they had never seen it before. And um, it was the first games where able-bodied kids were sending me drawings of like stick figures of people in wheelchairs on top <laughs> of metal podiums. They draw stick figures of me like missing an arm and I was like, close enough, mate. <laughs> <laughs> but... three, three limbs is pretty well there. <laughs> I know, it's still there. It's still a tripod in a way. Um, but yeah, it's like you, you can see how much of an impact Paris sport, seeing Parasport on television or in magazines has when you have kids like that drawing pictures. I will hope to see that continue at Birmingham. I, I hope that Paralympic sport is up on a pedestal up here and able-bodied sports is down here. <laughs> I'm always going to be pushing for that. Um, but it's, it's so wonderful being part of the Australian swim team, seeing our Olympic team genuinely like bring in our Paralympic team as one whole dolphin swim team. Um, I, I'm so excited to be able to walk into a Games and like we are genuinely one team. Mm. And for the world to be able to see like, yeah, that swim team is one team and try and find a way to integrate that into their own lives and their own workspaces. How important was the equal payment and, and, and treatment of the Paralympic movement alongside the Olympic movement? I remember the moment I found out that that was going to be happening. I was sitting at my table in the Athletes' Village just in my room and Rowan Crothers sent me a text saying that we were going to be getting equal pay. And I remember picking up the phone and I wrote back, oh, that's good, finally. And then kind of just tossed my phone aside and was continued on with what I was doing. And then I remember I took a moment and I just sat back and was like, wow, this is a historic day for us. And it's not about the money. I think when Rowan texted me, I was just thinking about, oh, it's money. But I kind of sat back and started thinking about the meaning behind equal pay, like our prime minister's getting up and standing in front of our country and saying that he sees us as equal. That's what was meaningful to me. And then I just, I broke down in tears in my, in my room. And um, I was like sobbing for 20 minutes and it was, 
the day of my last ever Paralympic race and it was kind of like the perfect way to finish off my Paralympic swimming career. And then um, I summoned the relay, actually swam quite well and we won a medal for our relay for my last ever race. And I was with Izzy Vincent. I shared that podium with a first time Paralympian, a 15 year old who is going to see the rewards of this, see the rewards of equal recognition for the rest of her life. And on the way home from the pool, it was just her and I walking back to the village together, just side by side. And I said to her, like, how do you feel about that? She's like, oh, it's good. I might be able to get myself a car when I'm older. Like she didn't, <laughs> she didn't really understand the meaning behind like how historic this moment actually was. And I remember I just chuckled at that comment because I was like, yeah, she doesn't get it yet. <laughs> but she, in a different place to where you were or where I was, she has your picture up on the wall. Yeah, well, exactly. And I remember like, I just chuckled at that comment and I just thought like, we're at a crossroads here mm. where I'm going to go down one path and finish my career you know, being seen as like one kind of athlete and she's gonna go down a different crossroad and be like totally embraced by the country and loved by Australia. And she doesn't even understand what that means yet. From and day one. From day one. And I was like, she doesn't understand how special that moment is because she doesn't need to worry about that anymore. And which so- is, Which is great, right? Yeah, that was like, like that little 100 metre walk home and that just little conversation with her was really special for me. And she doesn't understand why it was special. She has no concept of why that was special. And like, that's a good thing. What's Ellie Cole's legacy? Oh, that is a big question. That is a charged question. That is a question though for the greatest woman medal winner in the Paralympic, <laughs> Australian Paralympic movement of all time. That's. That's the question, right? Yeah, I don't know. Legacy is something that you always think about. Like, what are you going to leave this world with? I really want everyone to have, feel like they have an equal opportunity and be equipped to go after what they want. I'm so passionate about people with disabilities being given equal opportunities. Like, the amount of times that I walk into a business and be like, this place is not accessible. <laughs> <laughs> Pull your shit together <laughs> all the time. I never really felt 100% included up until the Tokyo Games. And I really want everybody to be able to feel that. Um, and so that's the legacy that I want to leave. Ellie Cole, I loved sharing a part of your journey within the Paralympic movement. I loved seeing you turn into the leader that you are. I cannot wait for what's next, but thanks for joining me on One Plus One. Thank you.